I wanted a British bike. I didn't want a Japanese bike. I think the design of, of British bikes is just lovely. They make a nice noise, they look nice, and they, they've got a certain style. I mean, when I go out on, on the airfield, I mean, loads of people like stop you all the time. It's mostly people who used to have them in, in the 50s, and, and they love it. They first think you've done a wonderful restoration job. And they love to see an old sort of airfield on the road again. The same machine, but made in Britain in 1954, is ridden by Don Morley in classic motorcycle trials. And, and really, that's what Royal Enfield designed this bike for. It, it started life as a trials bike rather than a, than a road bike. The bullet belongs to the golden age of the British motorcycle, when a restless new generation found freedom on the open road. In the early morning, the sun coming up, the blue skies, one and nine in your pocket, not a care in the bloody world, a tank full of petrol, and let them all come. Beautiful. All the arrogance of bloody youth. Great. I've still got it now. Yeah, only in a small quantity. And that was a motorcycle. They were the cafe racers, the tun-up boys and rockers, the kids who got their thrills on two wheels. And, sir, if so, you may have wondered what an Please. Well, we used to ride along, and all of a sudden, of course, we this was the the song in those days, and uh, song. Wilford's yeah, Wilford would start off with South American Joe, and uh, of course, r r ripping it out on top of your voice, oh. I couldn't sing it. Come on, you sing it. I can't. What now? Yes. He's got he, he's got air without, without a kink in it, it flashed in eye and what a wink in it. See, 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 that South American Joe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> the 20 years after World War II were a time of full employment and good pay. For the first time, young people enjoyed an affluence undreamt of by their parents and a mobility that had been out of reach before. The average working man went to Skegness or Blackpool if he lived in the Midlands, and he went to Brighton or Margate if he lived down south. And he either went by train or charabang until the day came that he got a motorcycle. And that motorcycle gave him the freedom to go and to move and to travel about when he or she wanted to. Hey, look at all those buildings, Reg. In it smashing. What, love? I said in it smashing. Yeah, it's all right. Come on, let's have a look at the chalet. The what? It was a way of getting to work, doing your courting, finding fresh horizons, exploring the country. It was a way of life, literally. They used to have runs. I can remember going on a midnight run to Whitley Bay, up near Newcastle, you know, and, and feeling on top of the world because it was dark and, and it was lonely and, and, you know, the cafe opened specially for us by arrangement and, and, and we had bacon and eggs and, and, and fried bread. Oh, boy! The bloody... The grease used to run down on my chest. And so did everybody else. Frozen stiff, you know, frozen stiff, going through the bloody night, yeah, and then back home to get up at 5 a.m. in the morning to get back to your bloody machine tool at 6 o'clock and get drafted. Craftsmen now true the front and rear frames by hand to give perfect alignment for all bolt holes and axle bearings. In the 1950s, the British motorcycle industry was at its peak. Royal Enfield of Redditch was just one of many firms in the Midlands that had started out building bicycles. It grew up alongside bigger names like Triumph, BSA and Norton. By the 1930s, there were 40 different makes of British motorbike. What had begun as a cottage industry was now the world's biggest producer of motorcycles.
hundreds of motorcyclists turn up in response to the call of the Chief Constable of Cheshire. He called for volunteers for work of national importance. That's all they knew. During the Second World War, motorcycle riders and manufacturers were called up for the war effort. Royal Enfield's sturdy designs found favour with the British forces. Over 50,000 saw action all over the world. Motorcycle firms were traditionally run by enthusiasts. In charge of Royal Enfield was Major Frank Smith. It was very difficult to, um, what shall we say, differ with him. Um, but on the other hand, he seemed to know what he was doing. He, he looked after the company for many, many years. Uh, and it had been successful, there's no doubt about it. It was a good old company to work for. Uh, didn't pay good wages. <laughs> For Enfield's team of road testers, there were few creature comforts. I suppose the dress of the tester uh, was uh, something like a blackberry and uh, goggles, and um, what we used to call a footing coat, uh, which was a large, uh, heavy sort of coat. It was silly, really. I mean, we used to go down the timing strip there at, uh, quite quickly, uh, head down on the tank, and uh, no safety helmet because you would have been a sissy then. I know it sounds silly, but you really would. I, I don't think you ever saw anybody on the road with a safety helmet on it. And the company didn't supply things like that. Oh, and no. Going back to the early days, the company didn't think anything at all. You, you went out and tested, and if you broke your neck, you, you broke your neck, and they'd got somebody else. That was, was a fact of life. And I remember doing this mileage in the winter, in the depths of the winter, getting home in the evening and, and just riding around the back of my house, well, my father's house, absolutely frozen to the bike. And I used to ride around the back and blow the horn and just fall against the shed. And mother and dad used to come outside and lift me off, drag me off the bike backwards and go and stand me by the fire to, to thaw out. Wilf Green was the Sheffield sales agent for Royal Enfield. They were a very old, old established firm. They were they hadn't progressed in the modern idiom in the way of a few Jack I'm all right. They were people of honour. And that is a very rare thing, kid. I've gone through life for nearly 77 years, and I can count on fingers of one hand the people that I would give the title honourable to. The bicycle and motorcycle show comes of age. World famous makers are exhibiting in the trade's 21st show in this great industry in which Britain leads the world. In 1947, Royal Enfield launched its first new post-war model, the 350cc Bullet, price £171, 9 shillings. A big selling point was rear springs, unheard of on motorbikes, which gave a smoother ride. It would be tempting to say that it's a very simple, simple design, but it's not. That that would be doing a considerable in injustice. It's a very clever design. And it's clever partly because all the units just bolt to each other. The gearbox just bolts straight to the engine, the primary transmission bolts to it, and it finishes up a very small, compact, but enormously strong lump. In fact, it's over-engineered. Its straightforward design made maintenance easy. Just a normal service. Um, if you're having your car service, they, they adjust the tappets, well, there and there. They change the oil filter, well, the same spanner, I've just undone that with, we'll undo this. Cartridge oil filter. I then undo that nut, which lets the old oil out, put it back, and pour the new oil straight in there. Ronnie Broadbent clean. Miss Leslie Blackburn of the Bradford Vagabond Club, a keen supporter of trials. Certainly not a trade of wet feet. Trials were where motorcycles proved their strength rather than their speed. And here, the Enfields were front runners. But once again, Johnny Britton and his Royal Enfield distinguished themselves. Johnny Britton was the Enfield team's star rider. Johnny Britton displays his mastery by making it look oh so easy. Pat Britton, Johnny's younger brother, a member of the Royal Enfield Works team. Other teams struggled to match the Enfield riders. Here, for instance, comes Malin. Here he comes. 
And there he goes. Only when Enfield's competitors tried the bullet for themselves did they discover the secret of its success. And in an instant, the other riders compared notes and said, what a tremendous advantage Johnny's got. No wonder he's won so many events. The Enfield's advantage over its rivals was its swinging arm suspension. Other trials bikes had the rear wheels fixed direct to the frame, but they soon learned from Enfield's success. And they went back to the respective factories, who immediately cut the whole back end off all of their machines and grafted on their version of swinging arm rear suspension, but never as good as the Royal Enfield. But the bullet remained virtually unbeatable, clocking up several hundred wins in the 1950s, which brought with it international recognition. And the Royal Enfield 350 Bullet was the most successful British trials bike, heavyweight trials bike of all time. This brought orders from America, Scandinavia, Belgium, and Africa, obviously, where the roads were rather poor, and India. And now it's time for the new models to show their faces. It's all part of a strenuous test which every cycle must pass before it goes to markets overseas. An old quarry provides as rough a course as you could wish to ride over, and this batch is evidently passing with full marks. Nice going for any country in the world. In 1954, the Indian Army ordered 800 bullets for immediate service on the Pakistan frontier. And the idea was that these machines had got to be seize-proof. In other words, uh, when they arrived at their destination, um, the rider had got to be able to just jump on the motorbike and drive it as hard as he wanted to, and it obviously hadn't got a seize. Uh, and we had quite a bit of fun with these. I mean, we used to screw it on out of the works there, and uh, you didn't go very far up the road until it tightened up, back to the works again and uh, off came the barrel and the piston and new piston and barrel went on and out again and this went on for quite a time didn't oh, it? Oh yes, we, we worked seven days a week. Hmm? The order was massive. In India the bullet was a hit, not only with the forces, so in 1956 Enfield set up a plant to build bikes in Madras. We had help from the technicians of uh, Enfield in making the parts here, in addition to sending several technicians from here to Redditch near Birmingham for training. A team was sent to learn how the bikes were built. Uh, it was a sort of family atmosphere there, definitely. And many people, like in other industries, I suppose, had put in years and years of service. Uh, many of them had their uh, gold wristwatch for the 50 years service there. A lot of their uh, senior apprentices, I would imagine they were, came over to, to Redditch and integrated into the works. And they went to all the different departments and spent so much time in each one. I had to make tea for the uh, seniors in the shop floor. and. Uh, when it was necessary to wipe the uh, toilet floor, I was, uh, I was asked to do that also. It gave me a good uh, insight into the value of every type of uh, work. Enfield of India opened for business in 1957. From assembling kits of parts shipped out from Britain, they gradually started to manufacture the whole bike in their own factory. Once underway, they were left to get on with building the 1955 model for the growing local market. But 
for the motorcycle industry back in Britain, there was trouble ahead. Boy, she's clapped up, Pete. You left me standing. I'll tell you, I'll be glad to get that thing a bite. I should. In a train of Herald, you can really follow your inclinations. By the early 60s, cheap cars were poaching in the motorcycle's territory. Thanks to all-round independent suspension, the wheels soak up the bumps while you soak up the scenery. There's a very quick gear change, too. It can only be the Triumph Herald. Ask your dealer for a trial drive. But anyway, I was walking down Haddon Road. You know where yeah, I mean, don't you? Down yeah. past the old picture yeah. house. Yeah, well, what were you doing down there? Well, I was waiting for you. <laughs> but, unfortunately, this chap came along in this blue MG. Yeah. You know, really something. And I thought, bye, this is a bit of all right. Yeah. And I thought, well, he probably won't come tonight anyway. He doesn't always arrive when he no, says he will. No, no, balls to green, eh? <laughs> yes. mm. So this chap stopped naturally and um, offered me a, a ride. We zoomed off down uh, Haddon Road into the distance, you know, leaving you goggle-eyed and bewildered. And... Yeah, I'm looking for another. Yes. Oh, but you went back then, didn't you, and bought a, an MG, a I, red one. I swapped my bloody motorbike. Hmm? Yes. For an MG midget. Hoping to get me back. Hoping to get your bike. But it didn't work. It didn't work. <laughs> I weren't. I was too proud to come and knock on bloody door. I thought, knackers. <laughs> but... And they didn't meet again for 38 years. But a bigger threat to the British bike came from Japan. The parts flow down to the assembly line on the conveyor. The assembly line for engines. The engine is assembled as the parts move from this side to the other. Now the final assembly. Japanese motorcycle firms have been growing steadily since the end of the war. Unlike the British, they designed their bikes for mass production and built them using the latest labour-saving automated techniques. ...and other minor parts are placed in position one after another as they move along the line. Thus, brand new motorcycles, smart but sturdy, come off the assembly line at an amazing speed of one every two minutes. The Japs were steadily coming in and the attitude of the people in Birmingham and Coventry was their copies of our product, leave them alone, ignore them. Now, when they started, they went over to TT and came nowhere for a time, and then they came over and wiped the eye of them, of the British stuff. Honda's Isle of Man TT wins in 1961 astonished the motorcycle world, and in 1962, they won all 25 races they entered. What's up, mate? Your elastic band gone, has it? Very funny. <laughs> yeah, what's the matter? Oh, I've got a partial seizure. Royal Enfield and other British firms stuck to their old methods. There was less and less money spent on development, so there was no new machinery coming along. And they seemed to be relying on the fact that they got this market already or that was a small market and it would go on continually year after year. They'd sell X number of machines every year and there was no money put down to develop new machinery of any size. And as a consequence, the, the models got older and older and, and became, you know, unrealistic to sell. I was not welcome. I was not welcome in Birmingham and Coventry because I opened that. After a visit to Tokyo in 1960, BSA's boss, Edward Turner, dismissed the threat of the Japanese bike. They will not appeal to the sporting rider to anything like the same extent as our own. What a bloody head-in-the-sand thing to say. And they closed their own doors because they lost touch with the people who were riding the motorcycles. All the time, when we designed something new, we're saying, well, I think we could use the so-and-so mud guards on this or the so-and-so tank, etc." cetera, um, which really wasn't the best way of doing it. I think had we said, all right, let's design something completely new, uh, we would have been a little more competitive. 
Don't worry, mate. I'll still be there before you. Ah, uh, you'll still be here. What a Next bit. year. It was the end of the road for the British motorcycle industry. Failure to modernize either their products or their production methods had made them easy targets for competition. The Japanese swept the market with competitively priced modern machines. During the 1960s and 70s, the great names gradually faded, and Royal Enfield's 80-year history came to an end in June 1970. But the story was not quite over. Far away from the cutthroat motorbike market in the West, Enfield India has flourished. There is no Japanese-style automation in this factory. The bikes are hand-built, but with a worker's average wage of just 50 pounds a month, they can still be profitable. The manufacturing traditions learned by the Indian apprentices at Royal Enfield in the 1950s had been passed on, and a skilled workforce still makes the bullet the old way. The Madras factory have produced 250,000 machines, five times the number Royal Enfield made in Redditch and it's the same 1955 model bullet they started making over 35 years ago. In India, a bullet is a treasured possession. Japanese and dealer la salu jaisti veki denga. Ma spare parts la romba costly. Adi la ma inda vandi bullet to vari kira mere anda vandi la romana vari kira denga. Inda bullet na ma enda arthur panali enda mule la panali yar ona mechanic well se vanga. Japanese and dealer well se amre denga. Adi kinte niya oru experience ona. Adi naal denga na inda bullet romana la vichir kena. Adi naal denga inda bullet na what denga. In Madras, there's a whole back street of men who can. The service and mechanical work is not done in England. England is not done in England. It's 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 not done in England. Meanwhile, in the Surrey town of Purley... No, we don't have any deluxe black. If you want deluxe black, it'll be another month's time. We can supply you with a red deluxe. Yeah. The company was formed initially purely with the intention of importing a British-designed bike back into Britain. There's no other British design bike is being produced anywhere else in the world. And we had contacts, so it was easier for us to set the ball rolling. Since 1988, 1,000 bullets have been imported into the UK. The job of unpacking them and preparing them for sale went to an old Enfield hand. Wolf Green's business has come a long way from its humble origins, and in his showroom, beside the latest foreign machines, sits a familiar old friend. It may not be called Royal Enfield anymore. That would hardly be appropriate for a product from the Republic of India. But for British motorcyclists, there is a corner of Madras that is forever Redditch. We had customers coming here that I sold bikes to in the 50s and 60s. Uh, one man, uh, well, we put an advert in the, in the local paper and said we, we'd come back to Enfields, come and have a look at them. Old-fashioned bikes, old-fashioned service, old-fashioned bugger. They came along, we had an open day. We gave them all a cup of tea and a bun, and the place was full, very, very nice. And amongst them was a good smattering of those who bought. Well, when I saw the machine and, and saw the type of engineering that went into it, it made me reminisce of my time as an apprentice on British Rail. I was apprentice in British Rail in the, in the 1950s, 
when the steam engines were coming to the end of their uh, era and we were starting on these diesels. Um, I found that there was a lot of things similar. I could take it apart and put it together again quite easily. It was something easy to maintain. So if I had a problem, I could sort it out myself. Technology on the new bikes, it makes it virtually untenable for the owner to do anything to it. He has to take it to a special service and workshop. And also, it's very cheap to use. The more performance you have, the more petrol you use, the more it costs. Whatever gear this is in, you just open the throttle, there's a big plodding noise and it moves. <laughs> Motorcycling was, it, it, it reigned all through the years as economical individual transport. It's a soulless hobby, it's a selfish hobby. You can get your motor car and stuff all your relatives in the back, or your flooses and your spare flooses, but you can't on a motorbike. You've got to have one light stellar, and if she does as she's told and rides with you properly, you've got a, a wonderful combination. We used to ride the bikes all the week and pay to do it, and then at weekends we'd be off down to then to London, to Dover, to anywhere to see, a, you know, Silverstone, see a motorcycle race. That was our weekend hobby after we'd been freezing all the week. That, that was our whole life, wasn't it? Mm. Oh, yes. And yes. we loved it. And we'd be there now if it was still going. Yes. If yes. the Enfield was still in, 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 we'd still be there earning peanuts. I'll, I'll put it this way. If one is asked to design a two-wheeler for utility and comfort of riding, joy of riding, one would design a bullet today.